Good morning. Would you stand with me? Let's begin to worship the Lord together.
hear our own name, and that sounds real sweet to us, especially when it comes from somebody that we know loves us. But you know who loves you more than anyone else? Jesus. And to hear his voice and to know that you belong to him is such a blessing. It is so sweet. Just like the chorus said, it fills my every moment.
I'm so thankful for our choir and the time that they put in each week. And I'm very appreciative to Scott and the time that he puts, puts in in leading them and, uh, and helping them along and, and for the sacrifices that are made, aren't you? I'm very thankful for all the sacrifices that are made in God's house. Uh, for the sake of illustration only, the Razorbacks won yesterday. I said for the sake of illustration only. What that mean, let me tell you what that means, just so you know. So in the future, when I say for the sake of illustration only, that means it's going to be tied to a point in the sermon that doesn't require a response from anyone in the room. Okay? So I just want to be very clear about that. So whenever I throw out that caveat, it's for a reason. Oh, you people. You people. I, uh, I tell you, I predicted that it was going to be three consecutive losses, but we'll see what happens on the next two. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Um, not, not a prophet by any stretch in, in that regard. I'm glad that you're here this morning because it's always good when we're in the Lord's house together. And, uh, you know, I had the thought yesterday when I pulled the game up and I looked at the score. And, uh, and I saw that I think it was uh, 13, no, I think it was 17 to 10. Somewhere along that lines, it was uh, not a whole lot of time left in the third quarter. And I thought, oh, there's a whole lot of game left. You know, A&M's going to pull this out. And then I went away because I really didn't care about it that much. So I went about to my duties of moving the house and those things that matter more, which is pleasing my bride and serving her. Uh, so I, uh, I went back to that. And then later on, I went and refreshed uh, on Google to see what the score was. And it was 20 to 10. And it was late in the fourth quarter. And this thought crossed my mind. It's possible... <laughs> I can't believe I'm even bringing myself to even admit this, but it's possible that the Razorbacks may be for real. Now, before we run the risk of any heresy coming out of this pulpit today, let me go ahead and bring it around, okay? I want to be a church that's for real. I want to be a church that when people walk in the doors, they know that's right where they're at. I want to be a church that's about the truth. I want to be a church that knows how to handle it. I don't want to be a church where only the preacher knows how to handle it. I want to be a church where the people know how to handle it. I don't want to be a church where only the preacher and the teachers know how to handle it. I want to be a church where everybody knows how to handle it. We're given a task in the Word of God today, and it's a big one. It's a big task, and it's the task of correctly handling the truth. It's a big task. We live in a world today that is struggling with this at levels that I don't think we could have ever even thought possible. The heresy that is being spilled forth and, and vomited and spewed out of pulpits ought to be appalling to the Christians of today. This is something that requires attention. And it needs to be discussed and it needs to be talked about rightly. 
And that's what we're going to do today with the Lord's help. Because that's the only way it happens. Amen. In our Bibles today, we're going to turn to 2 Timothy. And we're going to continue as we work our way through 2 Timothy. We're going to feed on verses 14 through 19. 14 through 19, it says today, an approved congregation. What matters to me is that we have God's approval. What matters to me is that what we do here is pleasing to Him. What matters to me is that we are trustworthy to Him. We ought to never be about the pleasing of people to the point that we are willing to take people's desires, that we are even willing to take people's problems and elevate them above the one and only priority of the church, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, let me be clear that when we come together and we make our time about the Lord Jesus Christ, when we make our time about learning the Word of God and and, and dividing it rightly, I'm here to tell you today, I guarantee you 100% with the authority of the Word of God that He will take care of whatever your needs are. That when problems come into your life, when health issues surface, when loved ones are struggling, whatever the case may be, I'm telling you that the Lord will meet your need. We need to know His Word. The world has said, let me speak to your need. Let me speak to the things that you want me to talk about. Let me speak to you concerning the things that I want you to know. That's a grievous error. We speak to Christ. We speak rightly out of the Word of God. We let the Holy Spirit move in the hearts of God's people. And then from there He equips. From there He provides. From there He gives us what we need on a daily basis to navigate whatever our day looks like. He does that. We do not rely on the creativity or the inspiration that can come out of a human mind. We rely solely on the Word of God as we point and focus our attentions and our affections on the only one that's worthy of those, and that's Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and we're going to begin reading. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with the sinner as I preach your Word today. Give me your grace. Oh, give me your grace. And pour it out. Father, be with everyone in this room. And with the help of your Holy Spirit, take the words that are said. And then bring them all the way to our hearts. Father, help us with our minds to understand what is said to our benefit. Father, just be present with us. Just be in this place. I pray, God, that this will be a place where we care so much about your truth. I pray, Father, that this is a place where we never want to take our eyes off the Scripture and off of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you will feed us and that you'll water us in ways that only you can. And I pray, God, that you'll bring comfort from your word today to those that need it in a way that only you can. I pray, God, that you'll confront us with your truth. I pray, God, that you'll warn us with your truth. I pray, God, that you will just make it known. What a blessing and what a privilege it is to get to have your word open and to be in this place and to do this. Father, you allow this, you let this. What a mercy and what a grace. Father, thank you for your compassions that are renewed in our lives every single morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and we say together, 
Amen. It says in verse 14, follow along please. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. Now Timothy has got this letter from Paul who is imprisoned, as we know. And Timothy is in amongst the congregation in Ephesus at this point in history. And he's going to have a very daunting task of carrying out the ministry that God has thrust in his heart, the hand that he's laid heavy on his life. And it's not, you know, it's not easy, it's, it's quite uh, difficult uh, when the Lord does that in the life of the minister. When his hand falls heavy, and then the minister realizes who he really is, and the gravity of the issue before him, this was an issue for Timothy, and Paul is speaking to him, and in the sense that, let me encourage you to remain true to the calling that God has placed on your life. But now, I'm going to take it up a notch. And I'm going to encourage you to do something that's very important. Listen to what he says. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. Speaking of the congregation there and the believers there. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus, and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The church ought to have this underline. The Lord knows those who are His. Praise God for that. The Lord knows those who are His. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Woo! There's a lot there. And with the Lord's help, we're going to break it down and we're going to let Him feed it to us. Much to our nutritious benefit... The pivotal verse that we want to hone in on in this block of text is verse 15. That's what this is about. It all stems from here. It's rooted here. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Amongst people who are going to be problematic for you in their own nature. This is a text that speaks to false teachers. It speaks to false teaching. This was a problem in Ephesus, no different than everywhere else in that region around them. And Timothy, in his youth, Timothy, now without Paul, left to himself with this task of carrying out the ministry and to speak the truth of God to these people who are not always ready or willing or even desire to hear it, to remain to the task. This right here is what it all, it's all about, this text, this verse in verse 15. Because if you take away verse 15, then the text around it becomes, at very best, a futile attempt. It requires a people that actually care to be approved by God. 
I heard somebody say that it's not a matter of caring about whether or not we're approved. It's a matter of caring enough as to whether or not we're approved. Do we care enough about what God thinks or whether He is pleased with us and the things that we say and the things that we do? The conversations that we have, the motivation of our hearts. It's important, it is crucial for someone to hold the banner and say, I want to present myself approved, a workman who correctly handles the word of truth, who God is pleased with. Do your best to present yourself as a Greek word, it's spudazzo. The word spudazzo, your version, if it's a King James or maybe the New American Standard, it'll say, study to show thyself approved. Not just to present oneself, but to understand how we do that. The way we do that is study. This is the only location in all of Scripture that spadazzo carries that meaning. It is the only place where it carries the meaning literally of to study. To know the Word of God. There are three things that I want to share with you today. And one of the things that I want to make sure that you know is that a congregation that is handling the truth, if we are to handle the truth, that it requires a level of sacrifice. Plan for it. Let the Holy Spirit carve it into your week. It requires a level of sacrifice for God's people. When we say we want to study to show thyself approved or to present ourselves to God in that fashion, it takes time. Discipleship is not something that we should be working into our schedule along the same lines of our children's soccer game or something else, whatever it is that, that our lives look like on a given week. Discipleship is something that we should be diligent to. We should schedule around our discipleship, not schedule our discipleship around the other areas of our life. When God's people decide that we're going to study to show thyself approved and that we're going to be a workman that is about the Lord's business and we know the scripture, it's going to be in the hearts of people that the Lord is working in that says, I'm going to move things around to make sure that I have what the Lord wants me to have. Amen. Can we not relate? If we get real, can we not relate? I can. I know what it's like to, to, to endeavor to do that, to get that priority wonky. I never stand before you as someone that can't relate to the very issues that the Scripture brings to the surface. And I get it. But when are we going to submit ourselves? When are we going to make it a matter of prayer? When are we going to ask the Lord, have your way with me? Have thine own way, Lord. You know that hymn? Have thine own way. What does it say after that? Thou art the what? The potter. And I am the clay. Mold me. The hymn says, mold me and make me. After thy will, while I am yielded, right? While I am still, like the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. We are so familiar with that, but you think about where, you know, what, what disciplines have to be in place? What does the condition of the heart of the Christian have to look at, look like, before we find ourselves ready for what the Lord wants to do in us? To show ourselves approved, to study, to show ourselves approved, being about our Father's business. Hmm. One approved. 
Spadazzo, do yourself to do your do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, but who correctly handles the word of truth. That handling, by the way, is to set forth straight. Okay, that's exactly what that means. Handling the truth requires sacrifice. It requires time. It requires time in the Word of God. It requires that time in discipleship. And it's interesting because he says further up, he makes that a priority there in chapter 2. He says, and trust to reliable men and the things you have heard me in verse 2 of chapter 2 and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So the discipleship and making disciples, I mean, that is a priority that Paul reveals to Timothy. And then here, he elaborates in verse 15. He says, this is how we find ourselves in that place. Verse 16, avoid godless chatter. Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Have you ever been in a conversation that was headed south and then it kept going that way? We kind of did it in Sunday school this morning. (laughs) Oh, I did it? (laughs) You going to put that on me, brother? When invitation comes, you know right where you need to be, right? Don't lie in church. You know... I say that laughingly, jokingly. We, we, it, it was a wonderful time, and the Lord did some really cool things. But, but in all seriousness, how often do we get engaged in conversations that head south? And, and once they're, they start moving in that direction, that's the only direction they can go in. I mean, and it just gets worse and worse. And, and, and he says here, talking about the teaching in the church, talking about how we, we convey this, 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 this the, the false teaching that's running rampant, it gets worse and worse. And do you know why false teaching gets worse and worse? Because false teaching is not about Christ. False teaching is about the Christian. False teaching is about the people that walk in the door. And us as people, we're always going to, it's never going to be enough. We're always going to want more and more and more. We're always going to want more excitement. We're always going to want more because that's in our nature. That's what we do. We always crave for ourselves. And so once that teaching is in that direction, it can never come around without a work of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and a complete shift of focus, which happens through what? Repentance. But until that happens, when it becomes, when the teaching becomes about the people, it will continue to go down and down and down into this horrific muck with this real clever costume on it. I don't know how long the Lord's going to give me on this planet. I don't know how long the Lord's going to give me here at this church. But I pray that the day that the Lord says you're not going to be there anymore, and I've seen it fit for you not to be, that, the, that all of you will be able to discern <clears throat> right away when you're in front of something that's right and you're in front of something that's wrong. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. They're teaching... These are teachers. They're teachers. These are people in the church with influence. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. That word gangrene, gangrena, is that word in the Greek. You know what that means? It comes from a root word, graino, and it means to gnaw. You know what gangrene is, right? When it gets a hold of flesh and the infection has gone beyond the point of being able to be fixed and that gangrene sets in and literally it begins to work and kill the flesh around it and it continues to go and go and go. It comes from a root word that means to gnaw. And when you get people in front of false teaching, that's what it does. It gnaws away like gangrene. 
Paul also compared it to a little bit of yeast that can ruin a whole batch of dough when he spoke to the Corinthians. This is another illustration of what it looks like. But you don't recognize it. At least there are those out there that aren't recognized. That there are people right now that are being gnawed on. And they don't even know it. The nerve endings have been shot. They don't feel the pain anymore. The infection just continues to run rampant. And they don't even realize that it's there. How sad is that today? Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Now this is interesting what Paul writes. In verse 17, he says, Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They've wandered away. They've just lollygagged away. They've wandered away for whatever reason. They've bought into a doctrine that is not accurate. I told you that handling the truth requires sacrifice. The second thing I want you to get right here from the text, it's right here 